uh, Midge Roy. So um, he came to us as a uh, uh, Dr. Stoyle recommended because in, when he was in Sands, again, for those of you who don't know, the uh, school of advanced military studies, right? School of advanced, I just wanted to serve the school. But that's that second year that our majors go to to get that master class in, in planning. And so then they go and become uh, division planners. He became the G5 planner for first ID. Now he's the now he's it now he's in the crucible. S3 for 118 infantry there at Fort Riley, about to go to Rajesh. And I know you're going to do it a uh, uh, a different way. So if you're hanging out, we can um, you know any one of us here. We hear about all the ways you can attack Rajesh. So uh, you hang out with us. We'll tell you the right way. Um, headed off to NTC here in a couple of weeks. So, um, all right, without any, any questions before we get going, Major Road. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the, the opening comments. Hey, hey team, uh, very glad to be here. Uh, we're going to touch on uh, subterranean doctrine overview. And so uh, when initially asked to provide some content for the, the course, I, I, I struggled a little bit because we have doctrine on it. But the doctrine uh, is very tactical. You can also go uh, look online and there's plenty of books talking about the strategic level uh, when we start talking uh, laws of armed conflict, uh, how, uh, you know, the Palestinian and Israelis leverage tunnels in different ways to at the strategic level. And that gap, you know, thankfully I was paired up with Dr. Stoyle at uh, Sam's, is that operational level. Where does this group tie the soldier that's about to enter a tunnel to the strategic enterprise uh, that's trying to end the conflict? And uh, by no means am I an expert, and I don't think anybody is really an expert on subterranean operations. We're always continuously studying. Um, we're, we're only starting to scratch the surface, and, and pun intended on that one. Um, so, so with that, j just a brief intro to where I, I, I got involved with this. So I had interacted with some tunnels in Afghanistan, as, as I'm sure many of you have, uh, Karezes that were used for weapons caches, very minor, you know, one or two offshoots uh, within the tunnel. Um, and that's where, uh, Morgan. and so that was my initial experience. I was fortunate enough to get selected and moved over to the asymmetric warfare group at Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, where we were tasked with developing a, a uh, mobile training team to support subterranean operations in response to the uh, Korean conflict that was potentially impending in 2017. Uh, with that, my passion for subterranean operations uh, developed because Went through the MTT uh, and we were getting directions. You know, this was 2017. We, we thought we were getting ready to cross the border any day. And they said, hey, congrats, you graduated the course. We're going to embed you with a uh, BCT and you're going to start clearing underground facilities probably within two weeks. Nuclear may be there, you know, chemical potentially, uh, but you're going to be advising them on, on this problem set. And so that was eye opening for me because I, I said, hey, I just took a two, two week course. I've never been to the Korean Peninsula. Um, that kind of generated my thought and passion in studying this because it is we are putting soldiers underground in one of a in a hospital inhospitable environment uh, and we owe them as staff officers every advantage as they descend down into those tunnels uh, so they say you're always supposed to open with a quote um, I try to get creative with the quote, so Wind in the Willows absolutely uh, applicable and so you'll see that theme uh, as we uh, dive into the course so the agenda, as I said, we'll lightly touch on the, uh, the doctrine overview, uh, but really it's a discussion and it's the concepts and the mental frameworks uh, that this group will kind of discuss that are going to really drive the course. Uh, as I said, I I'm, I'm a student just like everyone else. And then we'll touch on a case study, uh, particularly focused on uh, the Manila area. And the so what is develop a greater understanding of planning operations in the subterranean systems present in an urban environment. Because as we, as you all know very well, um, sub T is part of urban operations. They are never um, separated. And so I, I'll caveat, as General Woolrich said, I absolutely wish I could have been there yesterday for the on the ground overview, but I'll throw one piece of, uh, or one question at you. When you're doing the flyover of Razish, how many of you thought hey, there's probably tunnels under there that I need to account for when I'm planning. Okay, that's good, because there is a subterranean network underneath uh, Razish, uh, pretty extensive, uh, but that's just the framework and the, the mental uh, mindset you have to go in as you, uh, you try and tackle this problem set. So as I said, uh, in 2017, uh, the United States Army and, and the Joint Force really realized we had a, a gap 
in our uh, our doctrine when it came to subterranean operations. We spent over five hundred million dollars developing MTTs and training uh, BCTs, or brigade combat teams, to enter uh, these facilities. Because while special operations forces this may be in their purview, there's not enough when you start talking about a conflict in Korea, where you have you know thousands of underground facilities and tunnels. Uh, so soft can't attrit all of those. It takes line infantry or even um, non-infantry units to start clearing those uh, facilities. So really, when you look at it, uh, this is out of, uh, out of the subterranean manual, attributes of a sub subterranean system. And really, we'll break it down. First step, you just got to understand the environment. So when you look at the, the different uh, attributes, you want to look at the function. What's the purpose? Is it a C2 node? Are we putting all of our, our senior leaders in there as the uh, op four or the opposing force uh, to um, protect them? Are we using it for storage, weapons caches? Are we using it for operations? Do we, like the Palestinians or Hezbollah, use subterranean operations to cross borders and launch attacks uh, to, uh, to ke kill and kidnap? Are we using it to, as just general protection? Um, you know, the Ukrainians use that right now, or they did, uh, or they're still using it in a lot of different cases, going underground to avoid mass artillery fires. Mobility, are we talking culverts where I'm on my hands and knees, or, or I'm on my stomach crawling through, or are we talking subway tunnels that run for miles? Um, you know, we'll talk through some of the historical vignettes where thousands of uh, Warsaw fighters were able to yeah, basically move from different parts of the city during different phases of the operation, slowly attriting the Germans, but then escaping uh, to different parts of the city. Complexity of the breach. Do I just need a hooligan tool, uh, the, you know, the don door donker, or do I need some sophisticated engineer assets to breach a, uh, a solid metal door? What's the uh, support infrastructure? You know, going underground has its benefits, but it also has its limitations. Air, electricity, water supply. At some point, we're all human and we all need these, you know, we need water and we need food. Uh, so how do we, uh, how do we look at that? And then last is the threats and hazards. Not every sewer is going to have a, uh, a Russian with an AK-47 standing behind the corner waiting for you. Some are going to be empty. Some are just going to be regular sewers. Some are going to be underground facilities that are heavily defended. Uh, so you need to look at the, understand and this is where your IPB and your mission analysis will come in, is what type of facilities and systems are you looking at? And please, I, I didn't start at the beginning, but if there's any questions, please feel free to jump in. So as we look at it, we, we categorize uh, by three different types. Category one, tunnels, natural cavities, and caves. So the Kerez is uh, the tunnels that ISIS dug around Mosul. Then you have urban subsurface systems, your natural features that are already there, your basements, your parking garages, go anywhere in downtown DC and it is riddled with you know, category two. And then you have category three, which are your state sponsored, large scale military facilities. Think uh, North Korea, think Iran, where they're protecting most of their, inter, uh, their ballistic missiles. And one thing I'll note here, uh, as you look at the chart, there's very few clean up and down lines, you know, especially when it comes to the common hazards. They span all different categories. Uh, and that's just something to keep in mind is that as we look at this, um, it's never going to be a clean break. You may, you know, you can use a sewer system, an existing sewer system, make a 15 foot cut and dig into your own underground facility as a defender. And then you have now combined two different types of systems. Uh, so just it's never really that clean. When you look at the threat, what are we looking at? So traditional irregular forces, as I said, Quds Force, or not Quds Force, but um, Iran or, uh, Iranian uh, Republican Guard, irregular forces, the Hezbollahs that, that bring state-sponsored funding, but in an irregular fashion, and then uh, hybrid, so, or correction, hybrid being the uh, IRGC and the irregular threats being the ISIS. Uh, using subterranean drills to enhance their fortified positions in both Syria and in uh, Mosul. Before you go on, Sir. where was that top right picture taken? Sir, that is a uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard uh, missile facility. I, I forget. I think it's. I want to say it's. I, I don't know exactly, sir. The can, you, can you describe that for the people who can't see that picture? Yeah, absolutely. So as you can see, 
uh, commercially dug. Uh, you probably have about 50 feet of uh, clearance. Uh, you have huge uh, missiles being hidden in there, and it's probably several miles underground. So when you look at this, um, what's the support structure that has to go with that? If they're several miles underground, you need some sort of um, air system, correct? What, what else do you need for a system like that? Power generation. Exactly. So just from the, the picture alone, you can see power generation. What else? Water, air. Water, air, exactly. And if I, if I as a state sponsor, or as, as I as a, uh, a peer adversary, I'm going to spend probably close to... 50 to 100 million dollars to build a facility like this, I'm sure, surely going to guard it with a pretty substantial defense network. Question? Yeah, absolutely. Is there intel on what equipment they use to, to build these facilities? Because I don't think there are a lot of companies who can provide that equipment. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it on the, the unclassified level um, from a, it's commercial drilling. So Probably the same thing that digs the, uh, the um, New York subway system could be used to dig this. And you see that with ISIS uh, in Syria, where they were leveraging commercial tunnel equipment to build cutouts and tunnel systems to protect themselves from, uh, from coalition airstrikes. Uh, so you can report, you know, we in the military, we have commercial off the shelf equipment as well. And, and they can do that. It's just how big is your budget? Great question. Thank you. So talking about the Rock of Gibraltar in Spain, um, I know the Rock is UK territory, but it is Spain also, um, in this extensive tunnel system. <laughs> Uh, so maybe a UK friend would have, you know, so they were also doing this back then. So mm -hmm. this is pretty, pretty historic. Absolutely, man. And you're absolutely right. And that goes into the already what's already existing there. So the case study we'll talk, uh, Port, Fort Bonifacio in uh, Manila started off as MacArthur's underground facility before the Japanese invasion, transitioned to the Japanese headquarters uh, to protect, pr protect them from American air raids. And now it's a tourist attraction. So it can constantly be repurposed. The uh, Chechens during uh, the first and second uh, wars repurposed all the underground nuclear facilities, the, the bomb shelters, for their C2 nodes and their um, storage and weapons caches. So that, that's what makes this so dynamic, is you can construct something, you can already fall in on an existing structure, or you can uh, combine the two. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, that's me. All right, so when we look at uh, the doctrine overview when we start talking brigade and uh, battalion combat operations. So really, echelons above brigade. Um, what we kind of talked was what, when you're requesting echelons above brigade assets, obviously we know you're not going to get everything. You need to be very tailored in what you want to ask for based off of what you expect to encounter. So if you are Hypothetically, if you are comparing or planning for an operation in a small tunnel system just in the outskirts or the suburbs of a city versus going into the city's sub uh, subway metro system, there'd be a difference in the assets you're requesting. So when you look at this, that, that, that's one piece, but then also cyber. We're all interconnected. Um, cities are, you know, SCADA, uh, the uh, the system that that interlinks, you know, video cameras. How do we how do we bring all of our our assets to bear on something that we traditionally think is just putting soldiers uh, in tunnels? Host nation coalition forces. Uh, he, you always go with who knows the terrain best. Um, going in cold into tunnels uh, is not a, always a preferred method. Sometimes you have to do it, uh, but. Typically, when I went into a Karez, uh, or my soldiers went into a Karez, there was an ANA soldier with them that had, you know, known the area. Uh, for SOF and CF integration, absolutely key. Uh, as we said, that the North Korean problem set, that that is a whole of force, you know, that is a joint force problem, um, and that is the integration is key. What type of formation? Uh, 
Traditionally, you think IBCTs. Uh, IBCTs are best suited because they have the most amount of dismounts that can enter the tunnels. Strikers might be another option because strikers are, uh, are striker vehicles, which are our, our wheeled armored vehicles, um, may also be an option because they're best suited for urban terrain. ABCTs. When you're planning subterranean operations, and we'll hit it at the end, you're not planning in a vacuum. You can't just focus everything down. Just as you guys have learned over the last couple of days and you'll continue to talk through in the course, you're looking up at rooftops, you're looking at windows, you're looking at ground level, you're looking at the, uh, the RPG uh, team that's coming around corners. So you can't be solely focused down um, and you may need those uh, 25 millimeter Bushmaster cannons to provide that suppression to allow you to go into those tunnels um, undeterred. So defining the fight, this is, this is where you as the planner really have to set those, those boundaries uh, within urban operations and you, and you start talking about the subterranean environment. This is a, a way to kind of break it down. A battalion, typically a, a military grade under underground facility, typically takes a battalion. Uh, based off of casual casualty rates, you're attacking a prepared defense, uh, so you can anticipate at least a third of your casualties. Not to mention if you have any sort of cave-ins, uh, any sort of hazards, environmental hazards that may attrit your force, a battalion is probably the best, the right size. Then you go up, the brigade has a neighborhood. Within uh, certain downtown historic districts, you may have over 50 to 50, 60 different systems that, um, that need to be addressed, whether that's culverts, sewers, utility tunnels, prepared defenses, uh, underground facilities. Bump it up to division, you know, covering that larger area. So what, you know, hey, you have this slice of the city and then core looking at the, uh, you know, an even larger piece of that and just scale it up from there. It, there's no, no cookie cutter solution. Um, it, it's all based off the terrain and the threat. Scott, sure. when you're talking about that, you're talking about, are you saying that if you've got a, a, like a city at the city level, are you, are you suggesting that, that you would give the, that you would like draw a boundary line at the surface level and let a division take the entire underground network and have another division maybe going up over top of them. So just like you would be going left and right in, uh, on the surface, you would be going above and below. Yeah, yes, sir. So, I, I mean, if, if we're saying we're going to put a whole battalion into an underground facility, well, there takes a certain uh, another battalion to secure the, the uh, lines of communication and, and uh, protection around that. Uh, support area outside the, the entrances and exits that the battalion may operate. So, I, I mean, that, that's a great point, sir. Is, yeah, at, just like you have a left and right limit, if we start uh, using um, high ordnance mu munitions, uh, but we don't have a good frontline trace of where that battalion underground in the sewer may be, we may be unintentionally caving in a uh, the sewer on friendly forces. So that's where frontline traces and understand boundaries, knowing limits of advance uh, and clear commander's intent. Uh, because once you, once someone goes underground, you may or may not have communication with them uh, based off the depth and the equipment available. So as a, as a planner, what... <laughs> so as a planner, I wouldn't feel comfortable with the division below and the division above. I'd, I'd be more comfortable suggesting to the CD that there are smaller division boundaries and the division is responsible for all of that space because it's control of the airspace, it's moving between the domains, it's resupply, it's hazard back. Some people might be popping out on the surface and scurrying back through houses with a different division. I agree. Uh, the great point. I don't want to... But it, it, at some echelon, right, you need... The thing that should be blowing your mind as a planner right now is at some echelon, you should be just like a division controls the brigade frontages as they're going like that. They may have to stop or whatever. You, they're at some echelon. There's an above and below that you need to be controlling like this, just like you need to be controlling like that. And so, proceeding in three dimensions, that should blow every land component planner's mind in this room, right? Because we just don't do that. And so, I would I would actually agree with you that that it should be at a lower formation so that you can control it better. But still, if you're a battalion S three controlling two companies above and one company below, that should make your head hurt. 
the applying uh, doctrine. So mission analysis, uh, you know, that that's the bumper sticker uh, with anything when you start talking urban ops, but particularly sub T. Um, integrating all your war fighting functions, ensuring everybody has a seat at the table. Um, you know, the, the, the war fighting function that probably comes to mind when you talk tunnels is protection, but you can have non-lethal fires effects when you start talking about IO messaging. Hey, can we, can we have the, these uh, adversaries leave the tunnel just purely by pumping IO messages um, to make them withdraw? Sir, I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. So, multiple times over the course, we've heard integrate um, my question is, what, what value is giving someone uh, a seat at the table if they have no understanding of the war fighting function, how they can be applicable as a solution? So my, I, I guess, personal answer on that is, as an infantryman, I, I'm a generalist. My whole career, I'm a generalist. I can I can package up, you know, give me a platoon of engineers to clear a route, give me uh, a... Um, EW team to, to disrupt IEDs along my route, I'll integrate them how I see best, but they bring that specialization. They're the specialist. So I, I don't know when I'm breaching a um, underground system, I need that engineer at the table to tell me, hey, here's things you should consider. I need the public affairs specialist at the table to tell me, hey, if we destroy their entire water supply, we might have some bad press. Um, so that, that, that would be my answer is be a generalist, but keep the specialist there. Um, to 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 help you understand the problem set, and that, and that's where you as the planner. Maybe, maybe I missed. So, let's just say I'm an engineer. Okay. So the question I had for the engineers yesterday is, what value can they bring their capabilities below ground? Mm -hmm. uh, and they couldn't they couldn't answer me. They're like, well, I don't know. I don't know the doctrine. Uh, and I was like, well, do you know who you would go to so that we could gain that knowledge? And they were like, no, because we don't. We don't train explosives or these kind of techniques. So, like, what what is a planner's? What would be your recommendation on gaining the the civilian or those individuals that have that knowledge and bringing them? Those would be the ones that come to the table, not just the person that has the rank. But I'm, this is my war fighting. No, absolutely, and so and not to. You may have to reach outside of that that canvas talk. Uh, so, interagency partners. Um, you know, Department of State, other, other people will be able to interface with those um, those local partners. Um, I, I was very fortunate on, on deployments. Whenever I had attachments from uh, the Reserve or the National Guard, I, I always asked them, what, what do you do in your civilian life? I'm a cop. I'm a city manager. Well, hey, I, I need you because I'm, we're, we're going to, you know, try and do stability in this village. So I think it'd be applying. So, so just, um, just to tell you, if that answer came back from my engineers, and they're like, hey, sir, we never done underground stuff. I'd say, hey, planner, in 101, make sure that they train, go find some culverts and make sure that they train on that because I know they're going to need to be doing um, uh, 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 explosive breaches. You know, there's going to be some things underground that you're not going to be able to mechanically breach. So they're going to need to practice what that means. So I don't know, sir, I've never done it. That's not an answer, right? The answer is you better get smart on it before LD because, you know, if the, if the, if the IPB is telling me, hey, sir, you got to watch out for IEDs, you got to watch out for this, you know, it's a giant mass of shit underneath, underneath in, in these uh, utility corridors. So if we're thinking breaches, we're thinking EW guys like, sir, I have no idea how my stuff works underground. Well, you better figure it out. <laughs> So it's not, uh, I think it's less of a case of, you know, the guys not bringing somebody to the table because they're not really sure how to use their stuff and more of a case of punching them in the face and telling them you're going to figure it out before you LD. Sure. Yeah. Jason, sure. I mean, I'll also suggest, uh, speak up please, Jason. Sir, I'll, I'll also suggest for your doctrine. I've read the American Subterranean Doctrine publication from cover to cover and it's fantastic and it's very detailed. So that's always use doctrine as a start state. Like, we have to be nested in doctrine, not wedded to it. Sometimes you have to divorce from it. I get that. You check out trial publications, it's fantastic. Yeah. We have a question on online as well. No. Okay. Major sure. Hangar. The first place I jumped, the uh, military. The Colorado School of Mines, they are absolute experts on everything to do with underground, including demolitions movement. They have technologies with see through rock. Which they use mainly to find um, deposits, which you could easily use it uh, weapons, caches, uh, booby traps, things like that. Uh, 
I would bring, you know, we have a number of university partnerships that we nourish and give the I would definitely get those guys involved as quickly as possible. If you think you're going to do something because we don't train to this stuff normally. They do it every day. That's a great, that's a great point. Colorado School, I went to, I went to the band stand for the guy from the Colorado School line, right? So you may, just like you said, not just have reservists that might be a minor, right? And some of the tunnels, some of the tunnels around, just to again engage my, my European brother, some of the tunnels around uh, where I live, where they were blown out by Cornish rock miners because down in Cornwall, that, there's some serious mines down there. Mm -hmm. So that, that's a great, great point. Um, what's, what was the online question? So the online question is, at the battalion level, which could be magnitude for enablers that can be considered? Engineer squad or platoon EODs support units? So we'll, yeah, no, great question. So at, at the battalion level, what, what enablers, and I, I don't want to give out the Met TC, it, it does depend though, because it's also dependent on the facility, but also what you're actually going to be granted. Um, in a coin fight, I would always have a uh, two ship age 64 on pretty much any mission I wanted. In a date fight, I may not have that at the company or, or battalion level. Uh, so it, it's, uh, if, if we can, I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to, skirt the question we, we i think we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit in the next class yep so and then finally just giving clear doctrinal tasks um apply the doctrine that we all the language we all use to um so there's shared understanding do you want me to clear this tunnel do you want me to seize this tunnel do you want me to retain it can i bypass it all, all the all the good doctrinal uh language so we're all together on it um, which engineers were being asked about support for subterranean and provided that answer? That was yesterday at our NTC visit. Thank you, sir. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so as we get into uh, sustainment, uh, so what, what classes of supply will uh, the formation use? And I think the, the you know, most salient point, uh, during the Soviet-Afghan war, it took 6,000 rounds and 55 artillery shells on average to destroy an Afghan fighter. In Grozny, it took 7,500 bullets and 70 artillery rounds. So if you're a logistician, that's a lot of runs. Uh, that's a lot of uh, logistical lines. That not only do you need to keep uh, the ammo and the sustainment flowing, but then you also need to account for non-standers. Thermobarics uh, will play a big piece in subterranean operations. The little stuff, which we'll talk once again in the equipment piece, the chin strap. There's a chin strap extender for, for your helmet when you're wearing a pro mask. That is just the little things when you start talking sustainment and logistics and, and equipment that will all play into this uh, this fight. You know, echeloning it. How far do, do I want my field trains coming all the way up to the, the opening of the tunnel? Um, not only that, I have to now protect all my lines of communication. I, I know that's, that's nothing earth shattering, but when you don't know the routes that you may be attacked. I mean, I'm sure the Russians had a pretty good idea when they were going down the highways in Ukraine that they were probably going to get hot, hit from the left and the right. But if you don't know where they're going to pop out because they're utilizing a sewer system, um, that that complicates it. So determining where to place your uh, your logistics assets, seaburn de de contamination, uh, water. So to decon uh, is a huge, huge gap in, in our force right now. Uh, we're starting to work through it, but just the amount of water alone is a huge operation. And then, once again, if we are a company going down to conduct subterranean operations and there is chemical weapons present, we're in the middle of a uh, clearance operation in an urban environment. We all just got slimed. Um, hey, for everybody, you're going to get new weapons, you're going to get new optics, you're going to get new lasers, you're going to get new kit. So all that cool kit we bought at the store that is personalized to us, we're starting off from scratch. So those are the intangibles when you start talking um, equipment and, and logistics to think about. And then last, integration of that joint and combined logistics. Partner force, you have to account for them. Um, let's not send them down at a disadvantage as well. So you might need to bump your numbers up when you start talking different classes of supply and same with host nation forces. Touching on medical. So there, there's two types. There's physical and psychological. So the physical overpressure, you start having thermobaric grenades or any sort of, you know, even a, a 240 Bravo, a machine gun, 762 in a tunnel will have overpressure effects on your ears, long term or short term hearing loss uh, if proper protection is not 
uh, used. The reason I bring this up, I know that seems extremely tactical, but are you as a planner setting conditions before they even step into a tunnel and saying, hey, let's work and get try to get some peltors. Let's work to try and get some ear protection as they go down, all the way down to, you don't realize it until you get into a tunnel with no ambient light, but night vision goggles do not work in the dark without any sort of light. So are we gonna white light? Are we gonna use IR um, white light to, uh, to see what we're doing under tunnels? Respiratory injuries. We'll show a video. Uh, I want you to keep respiratory injuries in mind. And then uh, different conditions. So the oxygen, it may, may be good, maybe not. Low light, disorienting, uh, confined space. I will tell you, uh, I did not think I was claustrophobic, uh, and, and I don't think I am claustrophobic, but when you have full kit on and you are crawling through a tunnel, everybody's claustrophobic at some point. Um, so, and that's where the desensitiza desensitization comes in. So just like Navy SEALs or Marines, you know, they, they drown proof themselves, they work in the pool to, to desensitize, desensitize themselves to the environment. Try to think of creative ways how you can plan, you know, whether that's a uh, tunnel in a box, it's a Connex container and you build uh, a little mouse trap on the inside, or whether you find something in your area before you cross LD to get people acclimated to that environment. Sir. Yeah, depending on the width and the, the height of the tunnel, <clears throat> you adapt your uh, equipment, I guess. So, uh, and especially five light in the tunnel, that should be the starting point, I guess. It should. Depending on that analysis. You're absolutely right. Unless the enemy doesn't allow you because it's a contaminated environment and now you're in MOP4 with a pro mask with a, uh, a rebreather on that may, they may dictate the conditions, but you're absolutely right. If you can tailor down, tailor down. And so we, we, we hit on this, but as, you're, as a medical planner, hey, plan for a mask cow. Um, even the best units going into tunnels, you can have a, a, a whole tunnel collapse and you just lost an entire company in a matter of seconds to a tunnel collapse. What are we doing, one, to treat any casualties that we have that we're able to get out, and two, how are we planning on recovering these, uh, these individuals because we don't leave anybody behind? How, you know, what is our, what is our plan to, to recover? Casualty estimates, you know, anticipate 30% casualty rate right off the bat. Um, and then where, where you as a planner plan on having your reserves. Um, hey, I anticipate we are gonna have high casualties because we are in the downtown historic district and there is multiple entrances and exits to subterranean environments. I assess we are probably gonna need to place our reserve in vicinity of this general area. So break your paradigms. Um, th this is really critical as a planner, especially when you start talking um, the subterranean environment. So we, at the, you know, I'm going to overly be overly general here. We in the Western world do not like to go under underground. We don't consider that, um, you know, part of the fight. It's kind of like the the British Army uh, during the Revolutionary War. You know, we wear red coats and and march into battle versus the Rogers or uh, you know <coughs> the uh, Rogers Rangers using hit and run tactics. So when you think of that. Our enemies, on the other hand, and our adversaries do, uh, and, and our allies and partners. So this is the uh, Warsaw Uprising Monument. The tunnels and the subterranean environment was so important to them that they immortalized it in their, in their memorial of someone popping themselves out of the, uh, the sewer system. You also have the Chinese. This is in Beijing at the Hall of Tunnel Wars uh, from World War II uh, fighting against Japanese occupation. So in our adversaries' minds and our partners' minds, going underground uh, is actually a, a feasible option. So it's not, as we've discussed, it's not, inter it's not isolated. Uh, you don't have and or. It is interwoven into the urban environment. A lot of people and a lot of senior leaders when I engaged during my research uh, said, you can just bypass it. Just bypass it. You'll be fine. Um, there, there are numerous historical examples um, the Russians in Chechnya, both times. Uh, the Germans in World War II, where you bypass, uh, completely bypass the subterranean environment, you have just ceded an entire environment and freedom of maneuver to the adversary. Sub-T is only used for the, uh, the defense. Uh, I think the, the IDF would you know, argue that point because they are routinely 
experiencing cross-border tunnel incursions uh, as part of the Hezbollah and Palestinian um, or the uh, Hamas uh, cross-border attacks. Strategic implications. We, you know, Israel has gone to war over cross-border tunnel attacks. Uh, that's it. so. That's where we try to say it's not just a tactical problem. We are now bringing a country to war based off the subterranean environment, and then the, the perception of safety. So as long as I'm underground, I can't be touched. Your job as a planner, uh, if our adversary has this mindset, is to blow that that assumption up, literally and figuratively. Don't don't treat the symptoms. Treat the patient. If you are trying to play whack-a-mole with a sewer system, with a underground facility, you're just going to conti conti consistently chase the rabbit. So this is where you have to look at a different approach. And this is where, where you and you, you bring other people in with, with different perspectives on it. If I have a fighter pop out of a tunnel in this area, I know, all right, hey, ground force tells me, hey, it looks like a sewer line. It looks pretty extensive. All right, what am I thinking? I'm thinking that sewers are naturally gravity fed. Sewers naturally have to flow down to the low ground and typically into a creek or a river area. So rather than chasing him or her down into the tunnel, maybe I place uh, a blocking position near, near rivers, identify that exit so that I can want, you know, come from an indirect approach or I can just squat and hold and watch uh, this area to make sure that they're not resupplying through that avenue. You just got to look at it from, from a, a different piece. So treat the, treat the disease, not the symptoms. Make, yeah. make me think about uh, U.S. border, right? Cartels mm -hmm. doing what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I also think of Vietnam War, with yeah. BC being under just pops in the head. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Uh, you know, and it, it's, you're absolutely right with the, the cartels. It, it's not a, a state sponsored or something far away land. Uh, you literally have tunnels running across the Texas border that we have found and that we haven't found yet. There's another question, sir. Yeah, so can you talk to me about operational tempo then? So for operational planning consideration, mm -hmm. if it's an offense, and then we're talking in history or doctrine and giving your categories, what is the planning consideration for tempo? So tempo by itself? Given that sustainment and protection is within that definition, mm -hmm. what is is there a planning consideration at the brigade division and core level that we should be considering as planners? So, for example, you know you have those. And you, you just need something concrete. Mm -hmm. There is something more planning consideration. Yeah. So, crop mobility in up open terrain, two point three four dismounts, right? Okay. Is there something of such for subterranean? I'll have to get back to you on that one. If not, yeah. sure, that's historic, I just don't know if there's historic or doctor. Yep. Dr. Stoyle, I think, has a piece on that one. Yeah, so the answer is there isn't. Um, partially because really what you're talking about is the density of the subterranean system. It goes actually back to your verticality. Just like you can't do like a quick, hey, there's a vertical space. How much, what do I need? How much density of sensor do I have? You can't really do that for subterranean because the subterranean systems are uniquely determined by topography. They're uniquely determined by the type of usage. If uh, the direct point there, kind of the high density but adapted ones to the sewer system, that's going to change for if they're intentionally constructed with lots of defensive positions within them and over a large lateral area and at multiple depths. So it's really taking the consideration, some of the considerations we've heard on verticality already, and just applying it inverted, and then adding lateral considerations, which you don't have as much traditionally with verticality. So you're not going to be able to have just a single factor. It really, your um, operational environmental frame, your IDP, and what I would suggest is a engineering look at the geology to see how permissive this environment is for tunneling, we'll start to determine that for you, rather than going a one historical thing. And I'll suggest that no two subterranean systems are alike. Yeah. Literally every subterranean system in the world is different based on the soil and construction and everything like that. So there's the other challenge. You can't plug you. It just takes you five minutes to move 100 meters in a subterranean system. You don't so, to re reframe, I guess it begs the question that is this, right? Historical case studies. Then let me rephrase because you've invoked like some Palestinian studies. So, what, how long has it taken an Israeli battalion or brigade 
to clear category one historically, so that there is some kind of consideration. All everything you put it, I'm not saying it's not good to consider. I think intuitively, if you're a good planner with more salt, consider most of these. But you know, is there a basis of that to say, hey? For a battalion, for a category one like a Carez hole, it would take generally historically about a day or two. I think we get we get what you're you're grabbing at. You're trying to grab at a rule of thumb. You're trying to grab it. I just don't think we're going to get there in, in this class right now. So. Not, yes, I didn't know if there was any basis for that. If not, that's good. I mean, it's still something rather than that. So I can say these fairly stuff have fun and they're pretty practice. That's it. They real the first stage for them is to look at what unit they can send in because they have a they said it's the debut that it's and very much unit. And what the nature of the tunnel is, and what the objective of going in. So, are you just behind the tunnel for consumption, right? Or are you trying to use use it in an offensive manner? I go into an enemy as an adversary tunnel and use that to arrive at an enemy critical point. Like that, trying to hold the tunnel. So they have when they do it, there is a very long list of of questions they're going to ask, and then they're going to come up. But they also the people who come up with that. Aren't using a historical rule of thumb. They are actually they have a counter sub team specialist battalion who, anytime they expect sub team the environment, they bring them in to do a breakdown by each unit. So it's, again, it's not generalized even within the idea. They bring in the SME and say, okay, based on conditions, based on objective, based on your course of defendant, I am an SME and I think this is your planning factor. And then they always give like. I'll add this, but to uh, the major's point as well. Even the IDF, we brought, we went to their experts when we were looking at the Korea problem set, especially like YDT and some of the bigger facilities. Even the Israelis were like, "This is not what we, you know, you know." So every every, I think of it in the same terms of the urban and the urban environment. Every city is different, right? Uh, there's the mega city is not the village, and in the underground, it's the same thing. So North Korea may have the mega cities of of underground facilities. Well, that's a completely different discussion than a rabbit hole that somebody digs in Marawi because they don't want to get uh, absorbed during fire, right? And so the spectrum is so wide in this, and the considerations are so wide that even an expert in the rabbit holes may not understand the 200 miles of underground facility in YET. So I think that that um, building the expertise in this is important now, but to expect that there's someone who has the answers already you're looking for, I think right now it probably doesn't exist at the spectrum. Yeah, eh, sure. Yeah, yeah, we can uh, get moving. Yeah, absolutely. So, as we look at the uh, types of urban environments, we've been talking a lot of these drainage tunnels, bomb shelters. Um, how can an adversary employ it? How how long before we cross LD and start entering the city? Uh, are they having to hate, build hasty defenses based off existing structures, or do they have several months to make defensive belts, subterranean defensive belts, and interconnect their sustainment with their C2, uh, with their movement and maneuver? All consideration, massive delay or action. What what's the intent? I, I don't want you to, I don't want to retain the city. I just want to trick you and delay you enough so that I can build operational combat power in another area of the uh, the operational space. Um, and that that might be it. I'm going to keep this video a little short, but I want to go back to it because I think you don't truly understand the uh, ground level subterranean consideration until you see a video like this that really just captures it. This. Yep. So this is Chechens clearing the Azovstal uh, steel plant in Mariupol. Just the amount of frag grenades alone, as a logistician, are you accounting for that class five expenditure? Sorry, there's another video going in the background, but kind of capture it. This is probably their fifth or sixth attempt at the same entrance point. 
Sorry about that. There we go. When his father saw it in action, he was well, away. We'll go. We'll go back to that one. <laughs> YouTube ads, it doesn't always work out, but um, all right. So that, that just gives you a little bit of raw emotion of what your, your soldiers uh, will go through in a subterranean fight. As we go through, uh, we kind of talked this, what are some operational considerations that have failed? Bypassing, we talked about that uh, pretty heavily. We brought up Marawi. Uh, the amount of tunnels that were dug from building to building using the subterranean environment as well as already existing basements, they connected all those different basements together uh, to build an extensive network. Minutska Square uh, during the Second uh, Chechen War. It took over the, the Russians over, um, took them over a month to clear just a few blocks of neighborhood. Uh, one reporter reported seeing over 15 Russian soldiers go into one tunnel and they were all killed uh, within about five minutes. Um, so that, that is part of the, uh, part of the consideration. Manuka Square, 100 soldiers killed, uh, Russian soldiers killed um, in three hours. When we look at uh, just war theory, hey, um, let's just, Completely abandoned uh, Jus and Bellow, uh, you know, our, our, our just war theory. So let's uh, let's use smoke, let's use gas, let's uh, execute uh, or use extrajudicial killings. Let's use all these different tools that the Nazis used in uh, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising as well as the Warsaw Uprising. That didn't really, it helped a little bit, but at the end of the day, they were still extended for months at a time, having to pull additional resources from the Eastern Front to quell the Warsaw Uprising. Tactical level, uh, sub and tactical considerations. I think we've hit on that uh, when we start talking uh, different operations between Protective Edge, Northern Shield, uh, which have uh, started wars. And then uh, air supremacy. So uh, air supremacy will solve the problem. We can just bomb them. Uh, during Protective Edge, IDF knew uh, they had a pretty extensive understanding of the sub T network and where the entrances and exits were. They had a plan to destroy all of them and they did. However, there were some where they were missed, there were some that were easily repaired, and there were some uh, they just built new ones. Um, and same with the uh, Azovstal steel plant. So Azovstal steel plant, three or four months. They attrited so many of the, uh, the Russian munitions that they started having to transition to smart bombs, and Colonel Spencer can probably talk that a little bit better than I can, uh, but impact after impact, uh, it had no effect. Uh, which succeeded? So massing fires on an isolated area. I'm going to flip the coin there and talk Azovstal stall plan as well. So while there is an extensive subterranean network underneath the uh, factory, it is still isolated because it is, it's its own island. It's not tied into many other um, uh, pieces of the Mariupol subterranean network. Chura Yurt, same thing. Chechens tried to isolate themselves in the subterranean environment uh, during uh, the Chechen war. Russians were able to isolate and then mass fires. Development of tunnel specialists. This is what uh, Dr. Soil was talking as far as build the experts uh, that are capable of uh, in providing that advice to you as a planner. Leverage all the ints, human, OSINT. You know, we, you know, we pulled off, uh, you know, the Iranians. Uh, we have a great snapshot of Iranian subterranean networks because they posted it in open source media. Um, the more rigid the plan, the more rigid the timeline, the more likely the plan is going to go wrong uh, when you start incorporating the, uh, the subterranean environment. So keep it flexible, keep your timeline flexible as much as you can. Develop a framework. So what's the adversary trying to achieve? Do they want to attrit us? Do they want to hold the terrain? How much time has your adversary had? They've had months, they've had a few hours. Uh, anticipate as we said, you're going you're gonna to come across them in an urban environment. Make the subterranean environment untenable. Attack those life support structures, hit them with messaging, make it a environment that they don't go back to the wind in the willows quote. Don't let them be comfortable underground. And consider the subterranean environment a separate domain. Um, 
if you if you do not consider that or plan for that space, you have ceded that to the enemy. So we'll lightly touch on uh, Fort Bonifacio. Uh, so as discussed, this was uh, built in uh, 1940. Uh, as MacArthur anticipated a Japanese invasion, he built an underground uh, C2 network uh, for his headquarters. Uh, the Japanese took it over and they used it for their headquarters as well. And now it's a tourist attraction. As you look at some of these pictures, what do you anticipate? What, what are the benefits? What are the drawbacks? Well, it's pretty hardened, right? So, so from a, a protection aspect, it's probably probably a suitable place. But does it isolate me? Please. Yeah, so I was going to say the you know the entrance is in and out can easily be captured and make it an island as you suggested. And then just how are you how, how are you providing sustainment into it, and then how are you getting waste out of it in an orderly fashion? Which I'm sure it's built in there, but those could easily be blocked off by uh, another force. Absolutely. It's a great point. Am I, am I making my own crypt uh, by going down there? Great point. To Dr. Soil's point, do I have the capability to either blow my way through or drill through hard rock? And do I have the time to do it? Do I have the, the resident knowledge? Um, as an infantryman, I'm a P for plenty, so I can stack C4 against a wall. Uh, but I'm sure there's some engineer expertise that I would need to leverage. So as, as you do your case study in Manila, you know, Fort Bonifacio will be out there. Um, just consider that. I'll leave you with three key points. Um, if you've seen this before, as a staff officer, remember everything you plan and write must be executed by this man. He and his buddies will be the first to pay for your mistakes. So if you discount the subterranean environment, he'll pay for it or he or she will pay for it. Um, if you wanna go fast, go alone. Uh, if you wanna go far, go together bringing everybody to the table, leverage all those, you know, national level assets, local, local nationals, different uh, joint force components to solve the problem. And then last, and this is what I always try to reiterate uh, whenever I talk to the subject, don't get tunnel vision. Sub T is one component in the urban operations fight. If you are looking down at the ground, you're not looking up, you're not looking out, and there's a whole bunch of other threats uh, out there that will do just as much damage as the subterranean environment. Turn over. Take question. Questions. All right. Yeah. I just, gents, I think Scott, the ladies and gents, Scott's done a great job of introducing us to this challenge. But Stu, my urban operations department, and other Stu in future cities, got a short five page blur in here with some historical case studies and some military implications. Doesn't necessarily give you all the solutions, but get you thinking about what the solutions can be. So please read Stu's work here, uh, the short uh, subterranean chapter in there. I'd like to, to throw out just as a suggestion as well. Absolutely. So, well, no, Scott did a great job of staying on time. This was the original intent was to lecture for about an hour and then have a 15 minute discussion. So but I know we kind of stopped him along the way, but now now's our chance. We're actually on time. I like how a couple of slides back it said that uh, the subterranean is it's consider it as a separate domain. So yeah. like all the other domains is uh, is the army specializing in creating like a a force to deal directly because it's it's different equipment, it's different training, it's different tactics. So on the special operations side, there's a, a resident capability um, and knowledge. What the army tried to do was with the MTTs in 2000, the mobile training teams in 2019, was to build it at the brigade combat team level. Uh, so, uh, you know, asymmetric warfare group personnel came around and they said, hey, when you go, you know, we would take a barracks, put up blackout curtains uh, and black up um, plastic sheeting and it turned into an above ground tunnel and grow that experience at the ground level. Because at the end of the day, as an asymmetric warfare advisor, I was only with you for a short portion. My intent was to always teach that knowledge and make sure that it became resident in the unit. Um, so that, that was the Army's push to, to build it at the ground level. We still have some equipment, I believe, on the MTO, Broco torches, you know, engine, special uh, engineer equipment. Uh, so I'm sure we could, we could dust it off. Um, but at this time, I'm not tracking anybody that is specifically focused on it, at least in the conventional side. Yeah, sure. so to, to tag on that. So, um, you know, as we look at where we think we're going to do it, like, 
create connections the most likely. And so that create a rotational force that we sent out there. That's one of their training requirements is they have to train some to you. They have, you know, uh, several containers full of uh, equipment. Uh, so they'll either go with them or, Speak up a little bit. Is that or they'll draw. And so we do have that capability. It's just limited and it's, you know, the, the subject matter expertise isn't necessarily with the, the units. But that's where you as a planner, when you start looking at your training plans, how do you prepare, how do you desensitize people uh, and soldiers to this environment? So you, it doesn't cost much to buy a 20 foot container, have somebody that's a carpenter put in some plywood and build uh, a tunnel network within that 20 foot container. It doesn't take uh, much to, you know, work, find, you know, tape black up or blackout uh, curtains in a barracks room so you can clear uh, barracks hallways and, and rooms that way. It's low cost, and it's just whether the emphasis is there, and you want to train that. that that's two things I want to um, just jump on. When you talk about the expertise is resident in the unit, we went down and taught the unit. That was how many years ago? Two or three, sir. Yeah. So three years. How many people on active duty are still in that unit? Go. So expertise is up here, right? In your brain housing group, and when you move on, so you can't teach a unit shit. You can teach the people in the unit something. But then it moves on, and so that's that whack-a-mole. And for our, our for our allies, you guys understand what whack-a-mole is? So there's the used to be a game where the moles would whack up and you hit them with a big old hammer, right? And that game never ends. So that's whack-a-mole. So that's training is like that too, right? So I took that's interesting when you talk about okay, that well that expertise is now resident in that unit. The half life of that is not very long, right? The half life of that is you know, however long, you know, the rotation period is. So that unit, those IDCTs that you went down and spent all that time doing it, how much of that expertise was still resonating in that unit? Probably not much, sir. Same thing. I mean, you can walk, there's a lot of people walking around with combat patches on the right shoulder saying, you know, and then we look at, we look at, we go to a formation, we see 75% of people with no patch on their right shoulder. You're like, where have you guys been? Oh, wait, that's right. That was like 10 years ago, right? That was, a, that was a long time ago, and, and those people have got out. They've, we've got new people in, so think about that as you're going through the units. And the last thing I would say is that for a guy who's struggling to get $500,000 a year to run this course, right, which includes the, 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 the person, the, 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 uh, the support group, the people to plan it, manage it, travel, all that other stuff, $500,000. I can't get anybody to do that. But the Army just spent $500 million to teach sub-T to IBCTs, and that resonant, and that expertise, as I just said, is where? It's gone. It's, it's, it's certainly not, maybe, maybe somebody had it three years ago, but they haven't practiced it in three sure. years. So it's just, it, what, what that tells you is, is that why, just, just for my senior folks out here, why did they get that $500 million? What were we about to do again? Yeah. We were about to go fight in Korea, right? And then that was a big enough threat that somebody threw money at it, right? So that's something to think about when you're going from one place to another. If you're on a, if you're on the, the patch chart or you're on a short notice to go somewhere, then hopefully you're also going to get the resources to go with that. And hopefully those resources you can spend in time, right? In time to get what you need before you go. So that's a great discussion. Keep on going. Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, the so I actually dug tens of kilometers of tunnels in Mosul, um, but unlike what we've seen with the IDF and Gaza, it was it's largely missing from the narrative of the Battle of Mosul. Mm -hmm. Why why is that when there was such an extensive employment of it by Daesh? What was the reasons why it didn't really have the operational impact, or is it just that it got lost in the narrative and it, it actually was more significant? I, that's a great question, and I, I think it's, I don't know if sensory overload's the, the right point, but we were seeing so many other innovative things that ISIS was doing. We were seeing bulldozers that were rigged to be H, um, BV bed, uh, vehicle-borne IEDs. We were seeing, you know, pneumatic machine guns set up on, on rooftops. I, I think it probably got lost in the discussion a little bit. How, I'm um, pleased. Yeah, I mean, I really was on the ISIS tunnel around Mosul, and I think because they were storing the tunnels for the VBED and mm -hmm. munitions, that uh, they were just when they were coming out as when they were being hit mm -hmm. uh, with airstrikes or other fires. So it wasn't like the um, 
Iraqi security forces were going in into the tunnels as such, and they waited till they came out to engage them. And I think that was also from the lens of force protection and all some of the tunnels were under, they were not that deep, they were under residential homes. So there was a concern, again, of civilians being in these homes. Uh, but I just have a, another point, and I was talking to, where there you are, is that it would be very useful, um, we were just discussing, Jacob, like how we can, what good practices there are, also the bad practices, right? Um, and if they can be an inventory, and of course these things change, as you very uh, articulately said, depending on the conflict, the geology and the terrain. Uh, but I mean, I'm always looking for good ideas and practices, so it would be useful to see if there's more sharing of that um, from the experts on good practices of this. Uh, yeah, I think. On yeah, please. That one of the challenges is in a lot of armies, counter sub T exists in a high classification level. So, for instance, traditionally in the U.S., it's been resident in the special operations community, and so there are actual barriers right now to sharing. As countries start to move into thinking about this as a CBP, pro as a border problem, as a more generalized problem. So what I can say in looking at a particular country's problem set that the U.S. was looking at engaging that had significant subterranean, they were like, oh, yeah, that is a special operations task. And special operations planners came and said, no, we can do one of these. And that will be the entirety of special, op like that is your whole special operations. So, and so in that particular plan, it then went to, I forget, either the 82nd or the 101st to just like, okay, you will now deal with this. And they went, yeah, okay, you've just used our whole division on dealing with this. So anything else you had our division doing isn't. And then it moved up. And so one of the things they quickly realized in that particular look was that this needs to move on to being resident not just with the special operations, but basically every IBCT or ABCT may encounter this problem in stride and need to think of this. The Israelis are moving the same way. Um, they just, with Golani Infantry Brigade, added one, one counter tunnel capable, I want to say it's at squad level right now, squad per company. That's job is to do the initial identification and kind of handle it, starting to handle it and be the resident advisors that's pushed it down the level of classification as it's getting more generalized. And now there's some more communication that has happened. But one of the problems with sharing practices is these practices tend to be as closely guarded as like sources and methods in the Intel world. Mm -hmm. And so it's only now starting to diffuse. So we've, we've got a slightly more open uh, view of sharing practices. As you said, the Royal Tunnels, the Royal Gibraltar Regiment, yeah. which is one of the uh, regiments in the British Army, they're resident there and they're the tunnel experts for those type of tunnels. But we've also got other things like the caution lines. Going uh, great. We you build you tunnels in each of the training more. areas that we exactly. have as well. Like and we're starting to cycle yeah. more battalions. Yeah. So we've got the uh, UK tunnels. doctrine that's available, I mean, you can put it in open source. It's very similar, and I showed it to Major Rower when we were discussing this uh, a couple of months ago. It's very similar to what you do, but it, it's a quick read and it's nice and easy for people to get to. And because we're British, there's lots of pictures, not lots of writing as well. So it helps. Thanks. Sorry. Jim, just real quick, I want to pull out the, you know, as you guys are planners and thinking about this, um, that was a great idea, or that, or that um, the Israeli practice we're talking about have one squad per company, right? So if you know you're going to be going to the Korean, or you know you're going to some place where the tunnels are pervasive, and then you as a planner say, okay, so what we're going to do at the division level is we're going to set up a, a sub-T course, we're going to get the Colorado School Mines, find, talk to my SOCOM brothers and get some sub T experts, and I'm gonna get each infantry company to cough up one squad each to come into this thing for this time, we're gonna send them through, we'll put them back in their units so at least there's that resident capability. That's an example, as you're, as you're looking through all of these different problems that we're tackling here, that's an example of, yes, it may be a tactical thing, but like you said, it's that one little thing. It's the fuel card from yesterday that screws up the entire air movement because we couldn't have the fuel, right? It's the what? It's those tunnel systems that screwed up the entire attack because we didn't have somebody that was capable of doing it, right? But that's a great idea. I, I would say on that one, sir. You know, we uh, instead of tackling it from a tactical perspective first, we wanted to pick the brains at the planner and the thinking levels. And so, you know, those engineers who didn't have any idea on it were like, "Now's the time to get smart," because you're the guy. It's your job. You're black dog is an excuse. 
And so, you know, we would send out our engineers and, and eventually, yeah, we reorg a lot of our tier one courses just for this problem set because that's how big it got. Um, I, I don't think the scope and scale, like the cities, it's what's funny is uh, when you were talking about the, you know, people ignoring the cities, we'll just bypass it. Those are the exact same conversations for sub team. Um, and it is a separate domain. I would say sand civilians, this is the one terrain that is probably more difficult and, and more challenging and harder than urban uh, because of oxygen, because of chemicals, and because of other things. But uh, we can't bypass, we can't ignore it. And so I think that at the very least, having an expert in your planning level, not the tactical, the squatty level, at the planning level that a commander can turn to and say, hey, I set you out so you could be the guy in this to pick the brains up the best practices. I think right now that would be a, a probably a smart start. Um, I agree, and what I think is that the Indiana National Guard should become the subterranean division, <laughs> right? Because I heard, we already got, got the we got the urban thing taken care of. So I think the subterranean. Well, so, the, the Indiana National Guard, so I would say also there's some facilities out there that talk, they help develop and pay for, but I know 100% are open to all, and so Dugway has got some amazing facilities already out there. Um, they've got Dugway Ruby Grounds in Utah. Yes, sir. Uh, they, we've got uh, actual tunnels with actual air filter systems and, and entry breaching in the caves, and they've got a connex system there that's probably, what, 100 connexes um, for an above ground tunnel system, and, and so they've, they've done a lot of work in that area uh, for us, and it's open for anyone. Great, so Captain Hines can take advantage of that when his brigade and division become the sub T brigade division. I don't think I'm taking that recommendation back, mm -hmm. sir. <laughs> 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 Sir, to your point earlier about how that knowledge will get trained and then it will kind of dissipate amongst the force, like it should be a National Guard maybe down to that unit because there's units right there that will be, will spend their entire career in one unit. And then if you have National Guard units in, you know, in the mega cities, in our mega cities, New York, LA, they have the facilities there to train in and also the brains there that work in those kind of environments day to day to do training and I know I'm not you know sure how the, the army's organized and how you deploy and everything but if you're trying to keep uh keep a, a skill set like ongoing that's the National Guard. I mean that's that is one way so but we're all talking about exquisite kid these are sometimes exquisite capabilities or exquisite things. And we look at if you guys ever watched the YouTube video, there's a there's a football play from some college football team where they're and I'm not gonna explain American football now, <laughs> but there's a football where you can't pass forward in football, but you can pass laterally or you can pass back, right? So you hike the ball, they're way back by their own goal line, and they keep passing it back, and they keep passing it back, and they keep passing it back. I think it's a Duke game or whatever. And they they literally pass it like 30 times. And avoid tackles and stuff like that. It's funny one guy goes and runs down and he scores a touchdown. You watch that and you're like, why are flip, why are teams not training on that play? That was awesome. That worked great. That's a niche capability, right? So you should you still need to train football teams on basic blocking and tackling, throwing the football, you know, doing stuff like that. So we still need to as, uh, we still need to keep in mind that we can't tra we can't always train these niche capabilities but we have to understand where we can reach back for them. We have to understand what the plan considerations were, right? So now, hopefully, this morning, after this, you guys will be able to go back to your units or whatever, and somebody says, oh my God, there's, there's, we're going into urban area, and, and, and you know, I think we can do this, and you guys are like, hey, did anybody, is there any subways here? And they're like, oh my God, I need to think about that. Well, what about tunnels underneath? He's like, I went to a class that said this, oh, by the way, and you can reach back to this, and reach back to this, and we have enough time. It's very, you're right. It's good to have that niche capability somewhere in our giant army or our giant, you know, DOD. Maybe, maybe that's a Marine Corps thing. You guys, you guys gave up your tanks. Maybe you can pick on that. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, I, I also I agree that it, it should be like maybe a National Guard um, element that's become. I, I believe that it, uh, the National Guard should focus on this as well, just because it applies to just the operations and. Um, with our mega cities, and we may be like the most um, open to it, and the, like more I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, we might be the most or the most common people to to deal with this issue. I concur. And so, Captain Hines, now you have an NCIC for your subterranean <laughs> team. <laughs>
I just want to really second your point and bring up the point that uh, our soft colleague there brought up, which is we cannot think of this as niche capability. Because every theater of operations you are likely to which you are likely to deploy will have some training features at this point. Any major urban area, some have less, some have more, but has high density. My favorite one to use as an example is London, because that is a soil condition that is actually not well suited to subterranean constructs, and yet you have subterranean tunneling going back to the Roman period under there, and maybe not every single person in London will know how to get into the Roman part, but somebody does, <laughs> right? And in crisis, somebody's going to figure it out. And to give one historical example where this happened, the British built Acre prison on top of an old series of crusader fortresses. And one of the terrorists they had, or military groups they, guys they had in prison there, was an archaeologist. And knew that there were going to be crusader fortresses somewhere down there because there wasn't, shouldn't be a hill there, and so he figured there was ruin. What did he do? He figured out how to dig into the tunnel system and then develop a choice for the prison. And they had a little council of the military group in the prison. We can either bring in stuff, now because we've got unobserved access that goes all the way out to the ocean, we could actually drop off from ship at sea, bring it into the prison, or we could all go out through there, right? Because it was an old tunnel system, most people didn't know it was there, but somebody did, and they figured out how to use it. The second thing I'd ask, Mayor, could you talk a little bit about how we should be using this? The conversation to this point has all been how adversary might use it. But if, you're, if we're thinking about it from our doctrine and kind of from some of the other stuff, are there ways, if we're thinking about the urban fight, that we should think about employing the subterranean, not just as a threat, but as an advantage? Break your paradigm. You use it in an offensive capability. Nothing says that we can't put a platoon and maneuver through a subway system from um, you know one point to another in order to uh, provide surprise for a, an attack. Use it for deception. Let the enemy see you putting soldiers down into a tunnel system and then have that as your, your feint as you go uh, and do a left hook or a right hook.